Mill, Maryland, and we were at a restaurant that's called IQ Bar and Grill, which is the baby company to Allen Cuisine. Uh, they have six locations in the Maryland area, and we were blessed to be able to actually meet the senior vice president, whose name is Donna Powell Murphy, and we met uh, a wonderful hostess and Marsha. Our waitress today was Shanique, and the chef's name was Ivan. And we just had a marvelous meal. But with that said, we are so glad to be here today. We have uh, a wonderful topic that was actually submitted by uh, Denise Morgan very good friend of ours, and that subject is reconciliation, and we're going to get into the nuts and bolts, whatever way God wants us to express that uh, this evening. Myra, I tell you, we sat down uh, earlier today and um, had a pretty good conversation about it. I wish I could have recorded that conversation to include now because I probably will not make any of the points that I was thinking about then. But nevertheless, we are excited to be able to share this message. And with that said, I'm going to turn things over to Myra to give us an opening prayer and to lead us into this subject. And we mustn't forget, mm. Wendy, we met this lovely girl from Nicaragua. That's right. And had an opportunity to speak a little Spanish with her. Yeah. So we just thank God for this day, as all days, Father, you have prepared a place for us, not only in the world to come, but the time right here. And it's always with you, Father. And we thank you that you welcome us, you you embrace us, you care for us, you want the best for us and we are so thankful father may we respect that and love that and honor that by being the best we can be according to your nature father let us put off those things that would so easily beset us which is sin and just walk in the love and the faith and the hope and the joy that we have in jesus christ in his precious name Amen. 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 The topic of reconciliation. In the dictionary, uh, it says the act of causing two people or groups to become friendly again after an argument or disagreement. And when I looked up the biblical, there, there was some words, but what caught my attention was to be at peace again. To be at peace again. So that means that at one point we were at peace. So that, when was that? So that took me, well, first of all, 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 20. New Testament, New King James Version. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's us, those who have been called. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself always because he was in the beginning and always was not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And going back to that, to be at peace again, it just took me to Genesis. Genesis 2, starting at 7. And the Lord God formed man, the Lord God. This is the em emphasis, the Lord God. He formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. And he gave to him 
everything that he needed. I changed my pages again. <laughs> Thought I put them in order. This is life in God's garden. The Lord God planted a garden. He provided everything. Eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant and to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now he talks about this river that went out of Eden to water the garden and how it was it divided in different parts. And it was one which skirts the whole land of Havilah where there is gold, precious. And the gold of that land is good. Medallion and onk stone are there. And it goes on and talks about the rivers. And then it continues in 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. But in that day, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Someone that is equal in value to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. So Adam gave the names to all the cattle, the birds, all the beasts. But there was no helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God has taken from man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And what did Adam say? He said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and we're not ashamed. Sounds like perfection. And that's what it was. It was pure perfection. There was nothing that Adam had and consequently Eve that God hadn't given them. They were given food. That first of all, they were given a place to live. He provided a home, not just a roof with a covering. He pro provided Adam with a garden that was beautiful and had trees growing in it. And he provided food. He provided the waters. And even around him, there was precious gold and precious stones. But they weren't important because what he had given him was food and shelter. And even the shelter was the garden. It was his home. And he even provided for him a wife. But even before that, he gave him dominion over everything. He said, you name these creatures, whatever you name them. But the Lord God gave him everything he needed. And the bottom line was, they were both naked. And they weren't ashamed. Mm -hmm. Because there was nothing in their spiritual sight. Because this is interesting, because when you go to Genesis third verse, they have been beguiled. She had been, Eve had been beguiled by the serpent and talked to her husband, and he listened to her, and they both ate of the apple. And all of a sudden their eyes were open. And they saw they were naked. And they hid. And God came along looking for them. And he knew where they were. He said, Adam, where are you? I just want to say, uh, ate of the fruit. Yeah, they ate of the fruit. What did I say? Apple, Apple yeah. 
I got an apple. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I did mm-hmm. not mean to say apple. And they ate of this fruit. Thank you, dear. Mm-hmm. And they their eyes were open. But it's, it was more of this than natural eyes. Because before that, they were living in the spirit. And when God came looking for them, he said, he said, I was afraid and I hid. And that's where the separation started because God had given him everything he needed. He was not spiritually blind. He was spiritually awoke because there was nothing that was wanting in his life. But when he found out about this, when they found out about the garden, the um, the fruit in this garden, and Eve tempted him because she had been tempted. She tempted him. And he listened to her and forgot that he had dominion. And when he opened his eyes again in a way that he had not seen, his whole life changed because he had lost the relationship because everything he had God gave to him and what the enemy opened up was this there's gold there's this there's your naked the shame the the things that were raw that weren't important when he was walking with the Lord because what was important there was nothing to be ashamed of and that's where the separation came in. And that's where the conflict continued to continue, continue, continue between us and God, that we have to be at peace again. He wasn't at peace with God. Why would he be afraid? Because he had no peace. He had no peace anymore with, with God. Because that's that a lie had come in. A lie that said, you're naked. You should be ashamed. But before he ate of this knowledge, this worldly knowledge, I like to call it that, this worldly knowledge, there was nothing to be ashamed about because whatever God made was perfect. The garden was perfect. The food was perfect. His home was perfect. His wife was perfect. He had a position in that God that God gave him, and he gave that position away to his wife which she had no business having. And from that point on, you said the fall. Yeah, it was a fall. It was a collapse of a relationship that caused Jesus to actually have to come. It was all in God's plan. He knew that Jesus had to come and suffer and die and rise again to get us back, to be reconciled, reconcile us back to the Father, all because the relationship was separated because we had knowledge. But what kind of knowledge was that? It's worldly knowledge. Because you don't see Adam saying, oh, there's gold over there. There are these precious metals. He's not even thinking about that. He's just walking along in the garden. He's naming, he's doing whatever God tells him to do. He's naming the animals. He's breathing the air. But God knows he needs a helpmate, someone to walk alongside of him. And he gives him this woman because that's his plan, that man should not be alone. And that this couple with Adam as the head of the family would be an expression of the relationship between God and his creations. But he gave us free will. But he gave them a warning and they they didn't listen. Primarily her, and I say they because he didn't he could have slapped that piece of fruit right out of her hand. But he didn't. So then they weren't at peace anymore. He wasn't at peace. But the Bible says now all things are, are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, who has given us the ministry of reconciliation because his desire is that we all come back and be at peace with him. 
That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. All the struggle that Christ went through was because he wanted reconciliation. Not imputing their trespasses because from that day forward, we were all walking in sin. No matter what our lifestyle was, Mac has a different testimony from mine. You know, he would say, I was Miss Goody Two Shoes, <laughs> but I was a sinner nonetheless. But maybe I didn't have that great big sin that man calls a big sin. Hmm. And we could look at him and say, oh, he had this. And, but Myra, you, you were this. But we were all sinners. We were all walking in sin. But he says he's not imputing the, these trespasses to us. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation because he's forgiven us. We have been forgiven. And when we make that acknowledgement in our hearts that as the Holy Spirit has been going forth, and this is what we were talking about this morning, the Holy Spirit has been going forth seeking us for us to understand. I mean, the, the foolish things. The man that is foolish doesn't understand. But weren't we all foolish at one time? It's not, you don't have to stay foolish because the creation is evident. He was talking about being somewhere and seeing something that made him think that there's no way science or a big boom could do this. He was, he was talking about his fish <laughs> that he prepared the other day, that the bones and the structure even of a fish is so delicate that... No one could create that. The only one that could be the creator of such a marvelous thing as a fish with all of his scales and big bones and small bones and even the eyes and the way that fins, everything is beautifully created by God. And Romans talks about that, how we see that. But there's something within all of us. Imagine when Adam and Eve were banned from the garden. There had to be a longing within them. Well, look what we've lost. And we, we, we have nothing but sweat etiquette. We have to work hard all day. And she's going to suffer in childbirth. And, all the, and we had all this. And that longing has continued with us through the ages, because even in their struggles, you can still see the creation of God. God, he is abundant in blessings. A sunrise, a sunset. He is naturally a creator. He didn't have to give them desert and blizzards and thorns and thistles, which is written. But he also gave them sunshine and sunset and trees that did finally blossom. And he gave them wheat fields and, and all of that, all down the ages, we have been blessed with the presence of God in nature. But because of this sin nature, what do we look at? We're looking at the gold. We're looking at the, the success. We're looking at accomplishments and cars, and things. And it takes our focus off it and what we can do and how we are enough. Lies. Without him, we are nothing. And he so longs for us to be reconciled again to him, to be at peace with him. So this day, I, I ask you, are you naked and not ashamed to stand before the Lord and to receive from him all that he has for you? Say, Lord, here I am. I know I've sinned and I know I'm forgiven and I can speak as Adam who was probably speechless but so full of gratitude for all that God had done for him. He didn't have to see it with his natural eyes. He knew it in his spirit because his spiritual eyes were surrounded by the presence of God. He was in God and God was in him. And that's that reconciliation. 
We are in God and God is within us. And we have that charge to be ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. As um, I had stated in our opening, um, God has this amazing way of getting you to talk about a particular subject. Um, Myra and I don't always confer um, our thoughts on everything. Most of the time we are coming up with whatever we share. We come up with it independent of each other. Sometimes we might talk about it in a general sense. And that's what happened uh, this morning with us. And I was like, I, I can't tell you guys how amazed I was. Like the things that I was saying to her, I hadn't really even said within myself. I, I definitely have a, a game plan here that I'm going to follow. But when I thought about it, what Myra was trying to express, and I'll try to flesh it out a little bit more, is that when you think about the love of God, most of us go immediately to uh, John uh, 3.16, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. I mean, even the heathens know that that passage. But when I was thinking about it in context to this word reconciliation, I saw Jesus in a light that maybe I wasn't always seeing, or maybe it was just so subliminal that I just didn't think about it much, because we always talk about the salvation part of his ministry. Um, but we never think about the fact that up until that point, we were separated from God. And being separated from God means that we, I mean, even then you could say that he was already operating in grace that we would even be alive. Um, we know that Jesus came to really fulfill that word grace and to expand on grace. But anything that is outside of God could literally be taken off this earth and God would be more than justified so that we were able to live proves a lot of things that, number one, God has a plan. OK, um, he had a plan before anything was formed on this earth. The reason I know this is because if God always has been and always will be, there's nothing that escapes his attention. He doesn't react to what we do. He actually has already foreseen what we're going to do, and he has already made provision for it. So even in creation, knowing that the one entity in creation that would be the most like him, which would be us as human beings, that we would fail. Mm -hmm. he, he had to know. He had to know because he created the animal in which he could then take the skin from that animal, which many would look at as the very first animal sacrifice, would take the skin from that animal to clothe man, when as Myra said so uh, profoundly, man realized that he was naked and ashamed. And God made a provision. The, the man could not hide behind vegetation, could not hide behind a plant. No, God provided skin because something always has to die in order to redeem, reconcile, and restore mankind. And so in the tapestry 
of creation. Yes, I cooked some butterfly trout the other day. And what I was telling Myra, I was looking at it actually as she was eating leftovers because she couldn't finish the original meal. So she had it, it was last night, right? So she was eating it last night and I looked and I saw how, you know, she had a place where she was putting the bones, you know, because this is real fish, not filet, you know, real fish. And I broiled it. And so I was looking at that and, you know, the, the fish, the bones, they have thick ones. And they have very fine bones. And it made me think about, now this is also God's doing, how God originated the earth out of the mist and the heavens and everything on this earth. We say he, he made it out of nothing, but there was a mist in the atmosphere. And in that void, God then, from his mind, then created everything that we have known. Now, the funny thing is, is that with man, even though he had a concept of man, because he had already referred that he was going, he had created man, uh, male and female. It's talked about male and female. So we already had a gender identification for those that decided that they don't want to believe in gender identification. God had a gender identification even uh, before the garden. And uh, think about this, guys. And I know, uh, believe me, I'm getting the reconciliation. But in the midst of creation, God formed everything on the planet. And then mankind, as we read in the Bible, was the final piece because mankind is the one entity that would reflect him the most because we were made in his image, formed after his likeness. Unlike him, we are capable of rejecting him or accepting him, which honestly makes us even unique to him because God does not look upon evil. He doesn't consider evil. He doesn't have any part of evil yet. He made sure that when he created man, that we would have the opportunity of our own will to choose him or to choose our adversary. There's only two choices. So what's amazing to me in the midst of this, God didn't just manifest the man like he did everything else. God took from the very earth, let's call it the foundation, the very foundation land. And what he did, he shaped that dirt into a form, which we now call a human form. And from that first human form, God breathed into man, man, I'm saying that for, for emphasis, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, there was nothing that man could do to procreate, for there wasn't an opposite, or let me not even say opposite, complementary piece in order for man to actually duplicate himself. And so in the crazy, crazy, incredibly yeah. wise mind of God, he says, I'm going to take a bone that was actually formed from dirt, but became a bone. And from this bone, this rib, I'm going to create this complementary piece because he already knew that man in and of itself it would not be so good for him to be alone. And so man needed a companion that was a, a reflection of him with qualities that were not necessarily like his, but compliments. Notice, guys, we're not competing here. There's never 
been a competition in God's way of looking at men and women. We've made it competitive. God made it complementary. Never one above, never one beneath, but beside each other to work in harmony in the way that God would have it. I'm not going to get into teaching that lesson, but the point of the matter is, is that the moment that we stepped away from God is the moment that we then had to have a reconciliation plan. And when we talk about, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ is the reconciliation plan for mankind. We don't even understand what reconciliation means if we don't understand God's love for us, that God had every right to just wipe us off the planet. And he wanted to do it. The Bible tells us that he even wanted to repent, that he even made us. Nevertheless, even God will not change his script. And he continued on because he always had a plan of salvation. He always knew that we would fall short. He knew that we were going to need a savior. He knew that we needed to be reconciled. And so when I was thinking about that fish, and then I started thinking about mankind, and I thought about it because we talk about unreached areas of the world where people have not heard the gospel, and I won't argue that point, but what I would say is that, but everyone knows that there is mm. a God, a power, an authority that supersedes us, that's beyond our understanding, and all you have to do is to just look at creation. Mm. It should make everybody, if nothing else, a believer in creation. No man could manifest this. No big bang could do it. No chemical reaction could do it. Because again, where did the bang come from? Where did the chemicals come from? Where did these things come from? We need a beginning. God does not need a beginning because he always has been, always will be. It's beyond our scope of understanding. So why sweat the small stuff and trying to figure that out and just know he's superior. And if we know that he's superior, then we thank him that he has given us a reconciliation plan to be able to escape the separatism that we caused with him and bring us back into the family. So when I posted this event, this week, I posted it with some questions, and I'm going to address each question, plus I added a couple of more questions that I should have added, but I want to address these things, and of course, we are going to go to the text in everything that I share. So the first question is this, what is the biblical biblical definition of reconciliation. The biblical reconciliation is the process of two previously alienated parties coming to, Myra's word, to peace with each other because God has reconciled us to himself through Christ, we can reconcile with each other, no longer counting our offenses against one another. I had to go to the Bible because I don't want to just go by my definition or someone else's uh, man-made definition, but in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So even right there, before Christ, we were the ungodly. That doesn't sound like we have any connection with God whatsoever. So we were alienated with God in the beginning. And 
you know, there is a BC life, that BC life was before Christ. And then there's what we call the AD life after his death. And really, even, yeah, really, even after the death, because of course, he would resurrect, he would ascend, and he's coming back. We know all of this. But everything after his death, where because of his death, the the veil to the Holy of Holies was torn, literally, so that any man, any woman could access the holy place, the, the, the literal presence of Almighty God, Yahweh and not have to be concerned with a high priest of a male persuasion doing that for you. Because now in the place of that high priest of the old covenant, now Jesus has stepped in to be the intermediary between us and God our Father. So even when we're praying, we're praying to the Father through Christ in the same manner that our relationship should always reflect that. We're talking to our Father through Christ, our Savior, our Reconciler, our Redeemer, our Restorer. And so in Romans 5, 7, it says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God, y'all that like to go to the churches, you know how we do. But God, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Remember I talked about in Genesis you know, people don't think about it. When God clothed Adam with the skin of an animal, that animal for all practical purposes had been sacrificed because God loved us so much even then mm. that he created a sacrificial way of redeeming man back to him. In the old covenant, it was uh, a situational restoring. In the new covenant through Christ, we are redeemed once and for all. That's why we don't stay sinners. Stop it. Don't use that. We're not sinners, not in the, in the sight of God. We have sinned and we've fallen short of the glory, but we are no longer that in Christ. We, he sees us now. He relates to us as children, as the priesthood that will reign with Christ. And we have to stop putting ourselves back in a sinner situation. And we have to stop putting Christ back on the cross where he only had to die once and once and for all. So in Romans 5 verse 9, it says, much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, again, we weren't, I don't care how much we thought everything was good before Christ, we were enemies to God. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Remember, in a reconciliation, both parties agree to basically drop the charges. One side says, you're not guilty. The other side says, I, 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 I've sinned and I've fallen short. I, I, I've died to that. I put that away hmm. because I want to have a relationship. They're, both parties are coming together in unity collectively. All right. So then in Romans 5, 11, it says, and not only that, but we also 
rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Y'all should be saying glory, glory, hallelujah, because that, my beloveds, that is good, good, good news. I'm telling you, let me acknowledge some folks here real quick. Jackie Farmer in the house. Janae Nisi Poo, love you. I I'm telling you guys, this stuff ought to make you want to holler, throw up both your hands. Not the Marvin Gaye version, but the Holy Spirit version. Because we now have been part of a reconciliation. It's almost like a surgical procedure where the evilness is rooted out of us in surgery. And we're stitched back up by our creator to start this process over again as a new creation. That which was old has passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Y'all see how the word of God just neatly fits itself together? If this doesn't get you excited, I don't know what either Myra or myself could do for you. So let's continue on. So this is question number two that I posted. Um, it says, is there a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation? And you know what? I almost gave the answer in what I just said, but let me break it down to you. Yes, the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation is that forgiveness requires nothing from the person we're forgiving. And let me make a point. I do something crazy, which is very possible in my house. <laughs> in Myra for years, I mean, starting in the, the first year of our marriage, remember what you used to say? You used to say to me, I choose to love you, <laughs> which is really her way of saying, I choose to ignore <laughs> what you've done. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Let's tell the truth. Okay, you're getting you're getting one on one on our marriage right now, and that is noble, because what Myra was doing, she wasn't just submitting to me because I'm a male. Myra was operating in the function of a servant to her Lord, and in that. Understanding that God gave us Jesus who died for us, basically saying, I choose to love you. Myra took that into our marital situation and has said, I choose to love you, Mac. You're getting on my nerves right now, Mac. You are a thorn in my flesh, Mac. I'm not feeling you right now, Mac. Nevertheless, I forgive you, which is for reconciliation. Well, actually forgiveness. Let me let me take that back. That is forgiveness. Sorry. That is forgiveness. Because on my part, I might not even have a clue <laughs> that she's done any of this. Because she doesn't have to say it. She doesn't go out there with a, a, a you know, a, a blowhorn and just says, Mac, I have forgiven you. No, she just forgives. All right. And so when we're defining this, you know, we're talking about the fact that the person who is the offender does not necessarily have to match you with forgiveness. And so they don't even have to know that we are forgiving them. Reconciliation, on the other hand, requires repentance. Here's that word. I think that's next week's word. I can't wait to get to that word. But repentance from the offender. And in fact, I'm going to even expand on that. It could be offenders. Who's to say that both sides haven't been offended? So there's a requirement of repentance. And what is repentance? It's basically to drop that nonsense that you're... You, you're doing. There's no winners or losers. 
It doesn't matter because the relationship is more important than who wins the little battles. Okay? <laughs> the little battles, nobody is walking away with the Academy Award because they came in second or in third. <laughs> they don't win. Okay? But you do win when you don't have a care in the world. And no matter where you're placed in the category, you're chosen. And you're like, yes! You know, and and even your peers are like, you're deserving of this recognition. So there's a repentance that needs to take place. There's a humility because in repentance, one must be humble. And so in that humility, and even then, the uh, he or she does not dictate the terms of the reconciliation. It's mutual. It gets to what Myra talked about is peace on both sides of the fence in reconciliation. Forgiveness. Hey, somebody does something to me. I can forgive them. I, we talked about it this morning. I can forgive a mass murderer for killing someone in my family. I can do that because God has given me the power to do that. Does not mean I'm happy about it. Does not mean I'm not hurt by it. But I can forgive because God forgave us. That does not mean that the person who was the offender has changed his or her ways in any way. It means I have said, I put it in God's hands. I release you from my hurt. I release you from my disdain. I release you from my anger and my hatred. Because if I'm living in those things, I cannot be representing a holy God. And so you see, when we harbor those things, we take ourselves out of God's will, thus destroying the reconciliation that he has with us. In Matthew 5, 21 through 26, it says it like this. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whosoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. For those like me who struggle with anger management issues, we should contemplate on that more and really consider. And this is what's helped me to overcome just lashing out at the first sign of something that I feel is not going in my favor. Let me continue. Matthew 5, verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, remember the altar is a representation of the holy place now. And there, remember that your brother has something against you Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Let's stop there for a moment. My God, do you understand what's being said there? Okay, yeah. I mean, we can't even legitimately go into worship of our, mm -hmm. our Lord and Savior, if we haven't addressed the unreconciliation mm -hmm. of a relationship. 
In marital things, they say, don't go to bed angry, okay? But I can't even go into the assembly of God and legitimately worship when I'm harboring ill will towards someone. Again, it is impossible to render any gift of worship, any gift of anything that's relevant to God. If I'm coming basically with a dirty gift, hmm. a gift that's not pure. This is important to understand, guys, because this is all part of reconciliation. Because remember, we were the recipients of the perfect gift, and that is Christ. No spot nor wrinkle on him. So we, again, implement the things that are demonstrated through the relationship that Christ had with the Father. Okay, Romans, uh, excuse me, Matthew 5, and now I'm at uh, verse 25. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. Y'all hear that? Your adversary <laughs> could be the very point of your own condemnation. All right. The judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. This is incredible. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. And those of us of the new covenant understand that there's a particular prison that we don't want to be a part of because there is no paying back. It's over and which uh, eternally disconnected from God. Maxie, I see you watching. God bless you. Now, question number three. Is there a difference between human beings reconciling with each other and the reconciliation we need to have with God. And to this, I'm going to kind of be a little atmospheric here. I don't think it's so in, much important if there's a semblance or a difference. It's not so much about there being a difference in reconciling with God and with each other. It's more like understanding we can never truly reconcile with each other until we learn what it means to be reconciled with God. It all starts, it all ends with God. In reconciling with God, we recognize we are all the offenders. We're all guilty. We, we, we are admitting guilt. And we also, in that admission of guilt, we are declaring that God is sovereign. Mm -hmm. See, this is where we miss the mark. We keep just thinking that God is on our level. No, God is high. God is sovereign. He's greater than our, our uh, belated uh, queen of England. And the current King Charles, he, he's more elevated than any human monarchy. He is sovereign. He is the one that all mankind answers to. And so we submit and plead our guiltiness mm -hmm. and he forgives and brings us back to the right relationship with him. And in reconciling with each other, again, both parties may see the others as the offender, yet both come to the understanding that the harmony of the relationship is more important than the dispute. And in this case, both parties win back the relationship they had, thus we have a relationship now that can relate 
to the need to be reconciled with God and appreciate that reconciliation through Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 21, you heard Myra reference a part of that earlier, but I'm going to say it again because it's important to understand this. It says, now all things are of God. Okay, science community, understand that. LGBTQIA and whatever other letters come after that, understand that. Oh, to our social warriors, social civil warriors out there, understand that. To all of those who rely on intellect, we call them intellectuals and philosophers, understand that all things are of God. To those who continue to push agendas and sciences and witchcraft and all types of magical hocus pocus, remember all things are of God. Who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation? What a, what a beautiful thing. What a symmetry here. Once we come to the fact that we are reconciled in Christ to the Father, then immediately we're given an assignment to operate in the ministry of reconciliation. Whoa, for you evangelists, for you missionaries, that's good news. That means, boy, every time you're going out there, you can say, I'm a reconciler for the Lord. My ministry is about reconciliation. I wanna reconcile you to Jesus Christ. Oh my God, could you imagine? <laughs> could you imagine the reaction that you would get from people if you just boldly just walked up to people and said, Hey, you want to be reconciled to our Father through Christ today? Do you want to actually have a reconciled relationship with God? Mm, could you imagine? In 2 Corinthians 5 19, it says, That is that God was in Christ, in other words, using Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. In other words, he's cleaned the slate. He's taken the guilt away, so why don't we? And has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, look at this, guys. We get we go from ministers of reconciliation to this. Now we are, what's that word? Ambassadors for Christ. Oh my God. I went from being ungodly and Lord Jesus, and I came to you, all of a sudden, I was given. Uh, the ministry of reconciliation, and now I made it to the level of ambassador for Christ's glory, glory. I don't know. This stuff gets me excited because you can see the progressive steps that are going on in Scripture. And it says, as though God were pleading through us. You see that? We become the mouthpiece of God. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I, I might start using that word more often. I'm going to stop using some of these other words. Say, hey, come on, join me, and let's all be reconciled to God. And Myra tell you, I'm crazy enough to do that. Trust me. <laughs> okay. And then it uh, says in verse 21, it says, for he made him who knew no sin 
to be sin for us, of course, that's Jesus, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Doggy, I love it. So we come to the last and final question. I believe this is question number four, I think. Uh, it says, why does God give us the opportunity to seek reconciliation? Hey, have you ever thought about that? God didn't have to give that. Mm, no, he didn't. So it says that he's given us this opportunity because it's a gift. Now, remember, a gift does not require you to have done anything. Right. See? See what I'm saying? Um, today, I wanted to gift Myra with a restaurant experience that she'd never had before. It ended up being a gift for both of us, okay? Uh, because number one, I didn't have to cook. Number two, she didn't have to hear me complain about cooking. And number three is that we were actually able to have a date mm -hmm. and go out and just have a good time. You know, I was joking on the second part. I'm just having fun. Uh, but but on a serious note, um, we had some plans earlier today. They fell through, which means I didn't take any food out of the refrigerator or out of the freezer in order to unthaw. And I just said, you know what? Let's just have a good time. We very seldom get a chance to just be one-on-one -on -one and just enjoy ourselves that way. And it, it turned out to be a really great experience. Um, in fact, I, I'll tell you what I promise. For you YouTube uh, subscribers, I'm going to give you all a piece of some video that I took of our date uh, so that you can see it for yourselves. Um, but nevertheless, it was a gift. And Myra is, out of the two of us, <laughs> she is the greatest of gift givers because y'all might not think that this is really a big thing, but Myra will drag herself over to somewhere like, uh, was it Walgreen? That's her place. She likes Walgreen. She'll go to Walgreen, right? And she's shopping for her personal items, but there's never a time that she goes shopping that she doesn't think about me in some small way. Now, most of the time, that gift, no matter how I've been treating her, no matter how I've been acting, has usually resulted in a bag of pistachios. Now, I know y'all might not get all excited about pistachios, but I love pistachios. I put them on my salad. I eat them right out the bag. And in fact, it's almost impossible that I don't eat the whole thing in one setting. That's how much I love them. And, and so Myra's the gift that keeps on giving. Even to on my 60th birthday, she'd given me a gift, beautiful gift, expensive gift. But then what she did she did not just celebrate that day. She gave me each month on or about the 16th, which is my, my actual birth day or date, whatever. Uh, she gave me little knickknacks, not expensive, but just things that like say, hey, I'm celebrating you. Now, I know that some of us out there we don't get into birthdays and stuff in the celebration of self. That's not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm really trying to make is that she loved me enough that she gave me a gift not based upon anything that I did for her or, or anything other than she loves me. And that in itself, you know, you can believe that there's a true and living God because it doesn't make any sense for this beautiful woman to love me. Just understand that. So. What am I saying? When we relate this to scripture, we are literally saying, or God is really saying to us, ha, you deserve this gift. I'm just giving it to you. It's a gift that is given to us specifically by God. Why do we reject the one gift 
that he gives to everybody. Why? Uh, people that believe in evolution, why do we reject that gift? This gift of God is most clearly revealed in Jesus. And the reconciliation given through Jesus Christ results in personal forgiveness and transformation. Now, as I'm wrapping this thing up, I'm going to Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through, excuse me, 19 through 23. It says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the foot fullness should dwell. It pleases our daddy that the fullness dwell. And by him, Jesus Christ, to reconcile, uh, reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Again, there is no reconciliation without death. Mm. Jesus died that we would have life. An animal died so that Adam and Eve might have life. Today, we don't have to go through a natural death, but we die to our sin nature that we and others may live. Colossians 1 verse 21 says, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy. Remember, he presents us holy. We're not holy in and of ourselves, but he presents us holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So the next time you're contemplating who you are in Christ and you say that you're a sinner, I would let you think about changing that trajectory. And instead of thinking about it through your sight, think about it through his sight, because he presents us holy, blameless, above reproach. Mm. If I can't say this enough, I will never call anybody or myself who has received Christ. I will never call you a sinner. Never. And I will never call myself a sinner. Not today. Have I been one? Absolutely. Am I guilty as one? Absolutely. But in his sight, he sees me differently than I can even see myself. It doesn't make any sense in my natural body that I would be worth anything. I haven't done anything that meets God's approval. I don't deserve anything in reference to accolades. That's why when you know that you have a pompous preacher, a self-glorified preacher, he cannot be of God. Absolutely not. So you, God is already revealing to you that if somebody has to be referred to by their title like it's a requirement, you better call me Bishop, Dr. <laughs> Reverend then you already know that person is not of God. If I choose to call them that, that's on me. But I have many friends in the ministry that I have a first name basis. Believe it or not, I have a title too. And it's not a requirement in order to have conversation with me, nor to Myra. And so, Again, in the body of his flesh through death, we're presented as holy, blameless, and above approach in his sight. If indeed 
you continue in faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Why do we go out as ministers of reconciliation? Because we have a mandate to preach as well the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, again, as I'm wrapping this thing up, boy, I got more out of that than I even thought. Believe me, guys, I don't even go through these things. I take notes and then I trust the Holy Spirit to actually reveal stuff in the moment. But I want to get kind of up close and personal with you all now as Myra and I get ready to say farewell. Ministry is serious business. If you're doing this because of what you can get from it, you do not understand what ministry is. Myra left for Guatemala with what, 1995, right? Yes. And since 1995, Myra has been basically on the field in Chiquimula, Guatemala, from that point to this very day. And over those years, Myra started as a support for another ministry. She worked in a children's home. She lived in a room. <laughs> She'll tell you she ate burnt popcorn. I'm, I'm saying these things to let her know. I know, okay? <laughs> um, and she struggled with being able to even get the proper amount of quiet time with the Lord because the children continuously knocking on her door and situations of very serious consequences in some cases that pulled her attention away because they had to be addressed. It was nothing pretty about Myra and what God had called her to do. And Myra outgrew that situation, I believe, what was it, eight years? Eight and a half years. Eight and a half years. New beginnings, y'all. I'm just <laughs> saying that this stuff is working out in God's timing. And she transitioned from that. And she put herself in more fire by not being a support of a ministry, but being a head of a ministry. And going through the many things related to everything from uh, youth education to support for women, for families, for food distribution, for uh, um, uh, school scholarships, you know, for uh, young adult uh, education, more things that I, I have time to say on this program. I'm saying all these things, though, is that when yours truly in 2016 <laughs> took a trip to Chiquimula, Guatemala, I had to deal with a woman who was already well-versed in the Ministry of Reconciliation. This is a this true story. Now I'm giving y'all a different way of looking at our love story. She was operating in the Ministry of Reconciliation, taking her own example of how she was reconciled back to the Father through Christ and showing a gazillion young people, women, and men in some cases over the years that they too needed to embrace a reconciled life in Christ. 
And today, if I ever allowed her to speak, <laughs> she would tell you that today, for all of you mission groups to think you have to come and give the 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 you know what Christianity is all about one on one, she'll tell you her people are beyond that because the foundation has already been been laid. Why am I saying this now? Is because I could lie on air and tell you, oh, it was Myra's beauty that <laughs> drew me to marry her. I could tell you, oh, wow, it was her spectacular personality <laughs> that drew me to her. I could say those things. And so that I don't get in real trouble. Those things are true. <laughs> But the real ministry of reconciliation hit me like a thunderbolt. Because what I saw was a woman that did not have to be trained. She did not have to be encouraged or somehow led to try to understand things. A woman who knew and understood when I told her, I said, hey, you know, my life is God's. He's first. She knew it because that was her requirement of me. How could I do anything but ask for her hand in marriage? Because I know that she would understand that there are some parts of my life that will always be with God. Mm -hmm. There are some parts of her life that must always be with God. But when we come together, we can minister in reconciliation, which is what we're doing right now. And we can travel to the world and share this beautiful message of reconciliation to everyone who needs to hear it. Mm -hmm. Guys, we just want you all to be able to have that same testimony if you're married, if you're single, to be able to know that God is still your husbandman. You're still married, okay? You're married to him. And we all need to have that understanding that we're only in relationship with God because he reconciled us to him through Christ and that we must be open to reconciliation to the worst of us on this planet. Mm -hmm. Anything you need to add to that, darling? No. Mm -mm. Guys, we love you. Denise Morgan, thank you for giving us that word. Yes. Um, we love you much. Yes. Uh, we love all of you much. Yes. Guys, we live in an incredible time yes. in the whole trajectory of the planet. There's no time than right now that needs to know about Jesus Christ than right now. And like the Marines are looking for a few good men, <laughs> God is looking for a few ministers of reconciliation to bring those who have left the sheepfold, to bring them back into the fold and be part of the family again. God bless you and God keep you in his perfect peace with our minds, our bodies, our soul, our spirit mm -hmm. stayed on Jesus. Amen. Amen.